listening to Fair Play on JusticeNews.net. This is Fair Play on JusticeNews.net. Bruce Smith has spent over 20 years in a Florida state prison as part of his conviction of life without parole for allegedly killing a four-year-old boy, Cameron, in 2000, who was also the son of his girlfriend at that time. Bruce has maintained his innocence all these years, and he says he has never hit a child let alone killed one, especially when he has helped raise six of his own kids. And joining me right now from Claremont State Prison in Florida is Bruce Smith. Thank you for your time, Bruce, and welcome to Fair Play. Yes, sir, and thank you all, too, for having me. So, Bruce, if I could take you back in time in the year 2000, I think it was July of 2000 when this ordeal occurred, can you tell us exactly what happened? Yes, sir, I sure can. Back in, uh, I was a maintenance guy at apartment complex, and me and Teresa had been dating, and uh, it wasn't that long, probably like a, maybe a month or a month and a half, maybe, and she had asked me one day, I was at the apartment complex working, I was waiting on the tenants to come in to walk them through their apartment because they was just moving in, and she asked me to just look in on the boy, so at that time I had my son there, he was junior, he was there, and so I told her I would then that she told me they was already in bed that, you know, she didn't, all I had was looking in on them. So I said, okay. Well, after all that, I ended up walking the tenants through their apartment. And then shortly after that, she came back. Maybe it took probably about a good hour. And then she came back and uh, we both went inside her apartment. I helped her take the clothes and she went to the laundromat to dry clothes. And when she came back, I helped to take the clothes into the, uh, her apartment, and we sat there and we talked for a little while. Teresa went in the room and checked on her son because they all was in the bed. And one of them had got up, and he came in the living room with us and was sitting with us. And prior to that, she went back in uh, maybe an hour or two, an hour and a half later, and checked on him again. When she called me, she said, Bruce, um, he got some type of foam coming out of his mouth. Or it was either his mouth or his nose, I'm not sure. And so I didn't know that what it was, so I told her I didn't know. And so I said, well, let's just take him to the doctor. Well, she didn't want to take him because she said she had been, been in trouble with children and family before, and they would want to take her kids or lock her up. So mm-hmm. at that time, I didn't know what to say. So we just sit there for a little while, and I said, well, you don't know what's wrong. Then she came and told me he wouldn't wake up. So she was bouncing him off the bed, back and forth. And so I told her to stop doing that because she had his head, you know, kind of wiggling back and forth like she, you know, she could have hurt him. So she did, and we ended up taking him to the hospital. I drove her to the hospital with her son. And um, when we got to the hospital, she went in with her son and uh, I sat outside and at the same time my son was still there at her apartment so she wanted me to go and get the kids, her other two kids Mm -hmm. from her apartment and mine so I did I left the hospital, went to the apartment and got the kids and brought them back out to the the hospital and prior to that we ended up um, when I got back to the hospital the, the, uh, the security guard was telling me that she had said that she had told the doctor that I must have done something to her. So I asked her, did she say that? She said she didn't. And so I said, well, I need to know what was going on. And so then the doctor came back out and said, well, we don't have the proper equipment here to um, do what we need to do to him. So we're going to have him shipped to another hospital. So at that time, she said, okay. So she said she would ride with him, with him in the ambulance. So I took the vehicle and I went and I dropped my son off at my mother's house Mm -hmm. while they went to the hospital. So by the time I get to the hospital, they was already there and she 
and her family had started a lot of commotion, you know, like they didn't want me around and asking me what did I do. And so I kind of got upset because I was trying to get her to tell them that I didn't do anything. I said, she know I didn't do anything. I said, you need to tell your mom and them what happened. Well, she wasn't saying anything, so and they was pretty much blaming me, so I turned around and left. I just left the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I went back to the next day to try to see if she was all right, but her family was still there and she wouldn't they wouldn't let her talk to me. So I just stayed away until she contacted me, which was a couple of days later, which she did, um, call tried to call me and so I ended up calling her back. And at that time, I had met with a, it was an investigator there. And when I called out there, he said he wanted to talk with me. So I, he said, could you come out here? I told him, yeah. Then I did. I went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And after, after, at that time, after I got to the hospital, he said he didn't have that proper paperwork there with him. And actually, would I go down to his office? So I, you know, I agreed to go down to his office with him. Went to his office. He stayed in there four hours. He was asking me uh, all sorts of questions about different types of injuries. But mm -hmm. you know, the only thing I can tell him is that I didn't see her do it, and, and I didn't do anything to him the times that I was there, which I wasn't, you know, stationary in the apartment. I just went in and, and just kind of just stood outside until the, my tenants came, and then once I walked them through the apartment. And by then, she was coming back. And so that's when I um, went inside her apartment. Mm -hmm. But that was it when it came, when it came to that. Mm -hmm. And so after, after they, we, went, we went, went to the hospital. I went back to the hospital. I left the um, detective's office. And I was on my way back to the hospital when they, they ran the truck off the road. And I, at the time... I was I was riding in the van. Her it was her van. I was riding her van, and my my sister-in-law and my niece was with me. And um, actually, my sister-in-law was the one driving. And um, they kind of ran us off the road um, in some unmarked cars. And so once they did that, they got out. They draw guns on me, and mm -hmm. so I they was trying to tell me to get out, but I wouldn't because I say, well, you know, y'all y'all didn't tell me what it is about. You know, I'm not finna get out, and y'all got guns drawn on me. So she made him, was one of the detectives, made him put the guns down, and she asked me would I come out and talk with him. So I did. And then they placed me under arrest. They say for a failed uh, child support or something's concerning. No, they said a civil issue. It was a civil issue. So at that time, I went in, and they took me down. They locked me up, took me to Central Booking. Mm -hmm. And when I got down there, they told me that it was something dealing with child support. So I said, it can't be. I said, you know, because I pretty much got all my kids, so who, who am I on child support for? Well, that, that happened on a Friday. Mm -hmm. So I had to stay in the county jail all the way until Monday to go see the judge. Mm -hmm. Well, that Monday, when I went to go see the judge, they said that they had the wrong person for the child support. Mm -hmm. So at that time, he told me that they would release me, and by the time I get back to the county jail, my paperwork, as soon as my paperwork show up, they'll release me. Well, they ended up, um, uh, the detective came in, right, they had, they kept me downstairs because they told me there wasn't no sense in going back up to the cell because they said they're going to be releasing me. So I stayed downstairs, and the detective ended up coming in probably about another 20 or 25 or 30 minutes later and telling me that he had some bad news. So I said, what was it? And he told me that the child had died, and they was charging me with second-degree murder. Mm -hmm. And that's when... What did you say? I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I got real weak. He told me, go ahead and sit down because I was like, man, I, I can't be. I said, man, I ain't never touched nobody. I never hurt, hurt, a, that's the, that hurt and killed a baby. And he was like, yeah, I said, man, that's a lie. I said, that's, that can't be. It can't be. I said, I just can't believe this is going on. And so he said, yeah, well, based on what Teresa said, which was the kid's mother, I say, well, she she got to tell. I need to talk with her, but she need to tell the truth because I didn't do anything. I would never. She know I never touched those kids, and so they ended up um, locking me up at that point, and they took me back, and I didn't. I actually haven't been out since. But um, that's when they charged me with it, and then later that year, 
they took me down before the um, grand jury and indicted me on first degree felony murder. And that's what they took me to trial upon. So for a year, you sat in the jail? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I did. Did you have any attorneys at that time? No, sir, I didn't. Um, uh, well, they gave me a public defender during the time that I was in um, in the county jail, and me and her could never see eye to eye. She would never investigate. Would never. I gave her people to call that was there that that know what happened. You know, that knew her and had been around her. And she kept telling me, well, Bruce, they ain't going to be no good because they wasn't at the house that day. And I say, well, these people be around her. I, I barely, I didn't even know her last name was Smith until I started going to trial. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I really didn't know her like that. But I mean, like I say, I only knew her for probably 30 days or maybe a week or two over. But um, when they told, told me all that, I just, all I could do was just, it stunned me because she wouldn't build a working relationship with me. Mm -hmm. And so I filed a, a, a motion on Nelson. They gave me a Nelson hearing because I wrote a letter to the judge telling him that I didn't want her on my case because she wouldn't, she wasn't building a working relationship with me. And I had told him the things that I had done. I gave her a lot of people to call, people that could have helped me and showing that what she had done and she wouldn't go and investigate it. So during my trial, Mm -hmm. um, I had witnesses, which was one of them was my son who was there, and um, his mother had witnessed something. I think she had called her that day or something, and she called them during my trial and told them they wouldn't be needed because I had the case won. I had called all my witnesses and told me that we didn't, they didn't, she didn't need them because I had the case won, mm -hmm. and the jury came back with a guilty verdict. So. The only witness to that was the boy's mother, Teresa. Well, and she had put her two sons on the stage, which, I mean, on the stand, which um, both of them took the stand, and they was led by the, the state attorney because he basically just said uh, what he felt had happened and all they had to do was just say yes or no. But in the courtroom, they said, and he asked them, did they see, me, see the person that did this to their brother in the courtroom? Both of them said no. They didn't see the one that had committed that, that they say committed a crime. Now, they saying that one said that he was slammed into a wall. The other little boy say he was slammed on the floor. But the medical doctors, the personnel said that only one thing happened. And they say the type of injury he had, could neither one of those things had happened. Mm-hmm. And they saying, so based on what the medical uh, people that treated him said, no, he couldn't have been slammed into a wall because it would have caused damage to his neck. It would have been a bigger spot on his head. It would have been damage to his shoulders. And if he'd have been slammed on the floor, it would have been a bigger embrasion on his head than what was there, you know. And Teresa admitted on the stand that she um, used to beat her kids with her fists, her shoes, or whatever she can get her hands on. And, they, and that was pretty much like the heel of a shoe. If you ever seen a woman's shoe with the little skinny heel, that's the size. It was just a bigger share of fingernail. Mm -hmm. The dot that was on the back of his head, what they showed during trial. Mm -hmm. And if he'd have been slammed onto the floor, they said it would have been a whole bigger spot because where the head would have made contact. Yeah. And the mother uh, was on record having issues with the child protective services in the past is that correct yes sir she did she had been having problems with them and she also was at a, at a on a mental i think she had them been to a mental institution before uh something what had happened with the same boy and she was married to a guy that was named antonio smith and he went to prison for what he had done to the child and she went to a mental institution so as far as I had, and I find this stuff out, you know, prior to me being locked up and in prison, but um, she had, she had been, then she said she had, uh, took the stand, she had been Baker acted, and she also had been on suicide watch. So the police uh, believed a testimony of someone who was on a suicide watch? Yes, sir. They, and they allowed her to take the stand. Uh huh. And they also believed a four-year-old boy's testimony. She had, she had. Uh, well, he wasn't four. The one that was four was the one that was 
that had died. The one that one was seven and one was eight. Okay. So they believed the seven and eight year old boy's testimony and a woman's testimony who was on suicide watch for mental yes. issues. Yes, sir, she did. And who was also on record because the kid also had some other bruises prior to this injury. Yes, sir. And she was also on record for beating up this boy prior to his death. Yes, sir, she did. She was already, uh, even when the doctors came forward, they all of them testified that he had various sores. A lot of, he was covered in sores, they said. And he had, and someone was in various stages of healing that couldn't have happened that day. And they had, she said, they said that she had, I mean, he had a lot of scars that had healed and they was healing in different colors. They went. They took. They can tell it by the different colors uh, of the marks or what stage they was in. All right. So that means the boy was being beaten up prior to you coming into the scene. Yes, sir. He had been. All right. So when she left and asked you to take care of the kids, mm-hmm. where did where did she leave the boy? Uh, they all. She told me that they all was in bed, which they was. They all was in their room in bed. Um, I'm assuming they were including, was, including uh, your son. No, my son was outside with me. He was outside helping me. Um, you know, because I had to go in and do some clean up in the apartment before the, the tenants come. All right. So I had him with me at the time. And now, when he came, when she came back, I was still outside, and my son was in there with her at that point. All right. So. So she told you that she's going to go for the laundromat and she's left her kids sleeping in the room. Yes, sir. Did you ever enter the room? No, sir, I didn't. So all that time, where did you sit when you entered the house? Uh, she Right when you come in her front door, she had a, a living room area and I sat right in the living room area. Did you see the boy during that time? No, I didn't. He never you got... You never opened the door... No, sir. He never, never opened the door to peek in? No, sir, I didn't. He never got out. When she come, when she came back, she was the first one looking in. She went in there twice on two different occasions at two different times. Okay. So what you're saying is that from the moment she left the house and the moment she came back in to tell you something's wrong with the boy, throughout that time, you never saw the boy, you never entered his room. Is no, that sir. correct? No, sir. I never entered the room. Only thing I did is came in the house to the in the living room, and I was sitting there with my son at the time. Okay. So when they tried, when they convicted you, what was there any DNA evidence? Sir, what they had done uh, during my trial, they did have what they thought was blood on the floor. Um, they took pictures of it and they entered it into as, as evidence, but. When the analysts, uh, whoever they had test the, um, the stain that was on the carpet, they said it came back to be fingernail polish. But my thing was, you know, I'd never seen, I, and I told them from the beginning, and when I saw it, it looked like blood, but it was red fingernail polish, and I told them that they was lying. I said, no, cause I know I never went into any room, and then it was in their mother's room at that, so... I didn't know how it had got there, but it did test negative for DNA. All right. So what you're saying is that not in the room where the boy was sleeping, but in the mother's room, there was fake blood? Yes, sir. So somebody put nail polish in the mother's room on the floor? They put it on the floor. Yes, sir. This is bizarre, don't you think? Yes, it is. And, I, and you know, when I saw it, that's the first time I had knew about it when during my trial, you know, because my lawyer never said anything about it to me. And during the trial, they were showing slides of different things in the house. And what they tried to say was um, that, it, that that I had slammed them into the wall. They saying that I slammed them into a wall. And so they went in and they checked the wall. They say, well, all the walls was drywall. So they say the type of impact that he would have sustained, it would have damaged the drywall. Well, during trial, they came in and tried to say that being that I was the maintenance guy, that I knew how to fix drywall and that I had repaired it. But there was no way that that could have happened because they saying that I'd have had to cut out drywall, I'd have had to sand it down, I'd have had to glue it in, and then I'd have had to paint it in less than 30 minutes. And there's no way you can do that. Yeah, there's no way you can do that. You need a couple of days to do that. Exactly. Yeah, so 
uh, this is bizarre stuff. So, um, what I wanted to know is that you never saw the boy that night. Is that correct? No, sir. The only time I seen him was when she was bringing him out and when she asked me to come to the room to see what was on his nose. Um, I didn't get very close in. I stood to the door because she was just sitting in the bed. The bed was pretty much right by the room door anyway. But when I looked at it, that's all I did is look at it. And when we took him to the hospital, she grabbed him and um, we went to the hospital. What did you see on the nose of the boy? It looked like cold. It was kind of, it was something that was white. Um, I thought he was had a cold. He had asthma. And she had lied and told the doctors that she had an asthma uh, machine in her room. And But then they later found out that she didn't, you know, during trial, she admitted that she, she didn't have it. She she just said that to the doctor. But um, he had, a, he, he was, uh, he was suffering from asthma. And so that could have been, he could have easily been going into an asthma coma or, or having an asthma attack, I mean to say. Absolutely, it could be. And the defense didn't bother to look at any of these red flags? No, sir. She didn't bring up any of that. Uh huh. Was that a public defender? Yes, sir, it was. Mm -hmm. So, I have an article in front of me from uh, 2001, April 20 of 2001, mm -hmm. uh, from, uh, by Miss Debbie Salomon Vickham. Mm -hmm. Vickham, I hope I got her name right, of the Centennial staff. This is from the Orlando Centennial. Yes, sir. And, and the headline says, man gets life sentence for killing his girlfriend's son. Mm hmm So right there, do you have any issue with this headline? Yes, sir, I do. Um, I did see that headline. Uh, one of the officers had brought it to me while I was still there in, in the county jail. And I really, I totally disagree with it because the simple fact is, you know, this girl is walking around. She she's been abusing this child for 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 probably since he's been born, and and they and they all just lied and said that I and now I got to go to prison for a crime that I did not commit. And I you know it it hurted me a lot. You know, literally I I cried because I just couldn't believe that that was happening. And um, I, I tried to call a lot of my family members, which which. You know, they comforted me. A lot of them was there during the trial, and and you know, I kind of felt that I had won the trial because a lot of the experts were saying things in my favor. You know, mm. but it's just it just hurted me because to just think these people think that I'm some type of monster or something like that, which I'm not. And you know, and that hurted me because I had never even I, I never even touched my own kids. That's no talking about somebody else's. You know. I wouldn't even let my kid's mom beat <laughs> beat my children, you know. Mm. And so, I mean, it just hurted me real bad to even think that they even thought of me like that. Yeah. I had a conversation with uh, Janika. Janika? correct? Yes, that's one of my kids' mother. Yes. Janika. Yeah, Janika, she has uh, two kids with you. Yes, sir. And one of them is Bruce Jr., Bruce Smith Jr. Yes, sir. That's the same seven-year-old kid who was there in the house with you no sir he he was the younger one he, he's the, he's the third uh, all right so hmm. she told me that every time she would want you to discipline the kids you would say that okay let me talk to them and she would say what do you mean talk to them you need to whoop them but yes but you would say no I, i'm going to talk to them well, she did she that is correct she did used to say that <laughs> yeah uh she vouched for you oh that's good. i mean that's what she said yes you know she, she said that uh you know you she said that you can't be that guy right. because she has seen you with kids and uh, and she can vouch for you. Yes, sir. So it, the, the article that I mentioned, it says a former maintenance man is on his way to prison for life for beating his girlfriend's four-year-old son to death. An Orlando jury determined that Bruce Smith, 38, killed the boy last July by slamming his head into the floor or a wall. Yes, sir. Prosecutor said Smith then, Smith then put the injured child to bed where he apparently lay unconscious as death drew near. So, uh, how much truth is in this paragraph? It's none of it. None of it is the truth. I never even touched them. Their brothers, their, they had their two brothers take the stand, and their brothers literally told a story. They lied on the stand, and they asked them, have your mother ever beat y'all? 
They said no, and they have. They all had those scars, you know, and I used to tell her all the time, you know, you're going to get in trouble by beating these kids. You're hitting these kids too much. So I'm saying, these boys, you can talk to them. The article was saying that you slammed the boy uh, and, uh, you know, his head hit the floor. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that you you never even touched, you never even saw the kid, let alone touch him. No, sir. That day, I didn't never um, see, when I came, when I was at the apartment complex, but I never came to her house because at that day that I was there, like I said, I was waiting on some tenants to come in. And so when she, when I saw her, she was there and she just asked me what, because the apartment was like two doors down from hers. And so I was sitting outside with my son and she just asked me to sit because they was in bed and they was in bed. And she said she only had a couple of loads and something like that to dry. And she said it shouldn't take that long. So I said, okay, then that I had to sit there anyway. And, um, but I never went in the room to check on them. She told me they was in bed, so, you know, they were asleep. So I said, well, I mean, ain't no, what, no reason to go inside to um to see them because they sleep, you know. So I never did that. Yeah, and, and they never checked for your DNA on the boy. No, sir, they didn't. Mhm. Mm okay, that explains a lot. Yeah. And let me continue with the article. It says details about what what uh, caused the attack were sketchy, but it appears Smith was angry about some spilled water. Said Assistant State Attorney Robin Wilkinson, who prosecuted the case this week in Orlando. So, where did this theory about spilled water came from that you were angry at the kid? When, when she, well, I want to say they kind of made that up because once uh, children and family did come and they did take her kids. Okay, so when somehow between children and family getting the kids and her her auntie getting the kids back then that came out saying that um one of the kids was in the tub one of them took a bath which was her oldest son she say he took a bath and the children said they it, they contradicted a lot of the things that they were saying from what Robert, uh, the prosecutor was saying Mr. Wilkinson um the kids said that their brother was in the tub with them well Teresa saying that he never took a bath. So, you know, I don't know how they come up with that because all of them were saying different stories, which I didn't see him take a bath. I mean, but she said he did never take a bath and they still had the same clothes on from when she left. So that's where the water come in at because was, somebody was trying to say that he had to take a bath because one of the boys say he was in the tub with them, you know, and mm -hmm. so that's where that come from. Mm -hmm. And it goes on, when the boy's mother returned to her Orange County home after doing laundry, she thought her child was asleep, but when Cameron failed to stir, she realized that something was wrong. She rushed, rushed him to the hospital where he died. But there's a lot of holes in this too. The boy didn't die at the first hospital, he died at the second no. hospital, is that correct? Yes, he did, and that was literally four days later. Yeah, the article failed to mention that. And, right, uh, and then, and the then they... Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, no, and then they also uh, failed to, to say that I was the one ticket took him to the hospital, you know, and mm. I, I saw that and I kind of read that and I was like, you know, they just, and then and basically what I think, they just tried to put it in the jury's mind because, you know, a lot of times the jury hears a lot of stuff on news media, newspapers and such as, yeah. you know, stuff like that. So with her saying that, they was trying to paint a picture for them saying that, you know, I, I disappeared, I didn't go to the hospital, like I had done something or like I had to run or something, you know, and that's what I kind of gathered out of it. But I never, I, I mean, I took him to the hospital. I'm the one who wanted to take him. She didn't want to take him, you know, and yeah, I had no reason to run. Yeah, it, it, it shows that everything that is written in this article is false uh, from your perspective. Would that be correct to say? Yes, sir, it is. Yeah. I, I don't know how these uh, journalists are being. Uh, I don't know how th these journalists are being allowed to write something like this. Uh, I mean, they're a part of the Centennial staff. This is Orlando Centennial. So let's uh, let's continue a little more on this article. Uh, first of all, 
this article about this article you were informed by a police officer is that correct yes sir by it was a detective Hayes if I'm not mistaken concerning that he had died he, he came to the county jail yeah so a lot of police officers they make their police reports and they send it across to the media and then the media reports directly what they are fed by the uh, police officers and by the detectives right. so this kind of proves what I'm saying because these are all lines of what they were saying to you and what they were using to I I I think frame you right it was yes sir it was all right so let's move forward and and the fact that this article was written in April of 2001 I don't know what these guys were doing from July of 2000 right they were just asleep they got they had to be because they didn't um put anything in there from that day you know um even when i was arrested they they had an article saying something they where well, they made a comment on the news saying that i had been arrested for allegedly uh beating them to death and now you know you need to be mindful that even though they saying that in in the paper they saying that he was slammed on the into a wall or on a floor now if i was convicted and you actually knew what could what the crime was you would have known whether it was a floor or a wall but they didn't they failed to mention that all the experts that took the stand there in my trial said that neither one of them could have happened they didn't put that in there you know yeah they didn't put what the experts were saying and they put assumptions in the article that they failed to prove themselves right that's right man i mean that's some uh low ball journalism that's what i was saying So let me continue with this low ball journalism. His okay. two old his two older brothers ages 7 and 10 testified in court that they saw Smith Smith hit their sibling. What is this? Yeah. That's what they want them saying. They said that actually they didn't say it. Uh the state attorney said it and all they said was yes. They did you see Bruce slam your brother to a wall? One said yes. Did you see Bruce slam on the floor? Another one said yes. They had two. They were going to say it at two different times, but technically out of their mouth, when they came, when they took the stand, the prosecutor asked them, "Say, do you remember the day that your brother went to the hospital?" Both of them said no. But do you remember that 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 he had got hurt on a certain day? They said no. So how can but so from that point on. they kind of led the witness by saying things and then all they had to do was just say yes or no and then late wednesday the jury found smith guilty of first degree murder and aggravated child abuse i mean this sounds like a pack of bullshit to me excuse my language but this is what it deserves it's bullshit yes sir it is and you know and they um and and i was just you know concerned concerning the law itself they because they told me that okay being that you have been indicted for first degree felony murder we don't have to prove that you killed nobody we just got to prove that you committed a felony well based upon that you know you had the experts took the stand and said that what the boy said it couldn't have happened so how did I how was I convicted of a felony because the aggravated child abuse wasn't um they didn't find me I mean they they wasn't proven put it that way because both things that these that y'all saying the boy said when they took the stand they denied it they saying that they couldn't remember that day and then uh, on top of that it didn't match what the doctor said and so how could I be found guilty they told me if I'm found guilty of aggravated child abuse they can just find me guilty automatically for the murder they don't have to prove the murder and that's what they did mhm wow They don't have to prove the murder. No sir, not on a fan of when they charge you with a felony murder, they say the only thing that they had to prove was a felony was committed and they can give them a murder charge and that's what happens. Yeah, I mean they can give you any charges they want, but it's incumbent upon the defense attorney to show the truth. Right, exactly. Uh, a, a charge a, a charge is not a fact. A charge is not the truth. It's just a charge that is right. either exactly pushed back or proved i don't think the court right that's right uh, i don't think the prosecutors were able to prove that you had anything to do with this murder what would you say to that yes sir i bet i agree with that because the whole like i said the whole time i was sitting in the courtroom 
um, based on all the experts taking the stand and saying that, you know, none of the stuff that they that the state presented could have happened. Now, the state theory was to just put me there between eight, I mean, six and eight o'clock. Well, from what the uh, experts say that it couldn't have happened between six and eight, it had to happen between eight in time of admission to the hospital. That's what they said. Now, during that time, Teresa was back in the house and she was there with them. Hmm. So what you're saying is the experts are saying that it could have happened after she returned from the laundromat. Yes, they, they put the time at time of admission. They said an hour plus or minus a few minutes where well, he was admitted at 1030. Okay. So she says she got back from the from the laundromat at eight o'clock. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so they saying that it happened between eight and 1030. Yeah, or, or it could or it could have happened before she left for the laundromat. It, exactly. Now, that's what I'm saying, because, I mean, I don't know. And they kept asking me, did I see her do it? And I told them, no, I, did, I wasn't there when she beat him. I mean, I, I mean, when I came there, she just told me to look in on him. And, you know, by the time she came back, after, shortly after that, I left. So, I mean, it wasn't like I was there with her the whole time, because I ended up leaving her there going to McDonald's getting some food and coming back so yeah I mean during that time and that was after eight but I think what happened to him had happened before she had left all right uh, so again I'm going to take you back to this article because there's not a lot of material available on your case which is also weird mm-hmm. but whatever that we have is full of holes as well because let me continue with this article so the circuit judge Donald Donald Groswell he sentenced you to life plus 15 years in prison just like that yes sir he did based on this yes sir uh-huh okay and then the defense lawyer Trish Cashman tried to blame the boy's mother for the death she said Theresa Smith 27 was home at the time experts estimated the fatal head injury occurred that's what, exactly this goes against everything that i've been reading from the article right that's what i just that same thing i just said they, all the experts put a time during the time she was there yeah so they just put this article at the end of the this is this line at the, somewhere in the middle uh try to maybe create some balance but then cashman said the mother a machine operator admitted using corporal punishment on her children in the past. Yes, she did. I mean, the judges, the judges and the defense attorney they didn't look at that. That hey, I mean, this mother, we gotta investigate what this mother has been up to. Right. Well, they they did a motion to uh, I think the name of it was motion in limine or something like that, and that what that does to hide evidence that the state don't want to come out to the jury. And the judge granted her motion. And later I found out that, you know, the motion that she had, that she had put in for him not, for the jury not to hear, was that Teresa had been Baker acted, that she had been, she done had a suicide attempt, um, that she had, that her husband was in prison for the same thing, for abusing the same little boy, which was his little boy and beating the other kids, and then her other kid's father was in prison for allegedly, I think, beating his son. The two oldest boys was someone else's, and I think their dad was in prison for what she say he did to the kids, but he was saying the same thing. He said she did it, that he didn't do it, but he ended up in prison. So, um, And then her husband ended up in prison for a crime that they both did to the children. So... That was what they hid inside this motion that she filed. So what you're saying is that based on this, probably the other guys who were in prison didn't really do what they've been accused of, too. Yes, sir. yes, sir. My understanding there, her, 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 uh, her first kid's father saying whatever happened, she had done it. Mm-hmm. So at least the first father is on the record saying that I didn't do it, and they put him in prison because she testified against him. I think so, yes, sir. By the way, the thing about your defense attorney, uh, Trish Cashman, saying that, you know, the um, mother was at home at the time of the fatal injury and that, you know, the, she had admitted using corporal punishment uh, and that she had she was, she was had admitted using corporal punishment on, her, on her children in the past. All of this is at the end of the article. 
so this was a what would you say about this article by the way well i really didn't like it because i what happened my sister-in-law had read it and she's a school teacher and she kind of brought it to my attention and she wrote the orlando sentinel um concerning that article you know telling them you know and i think if i'm not mistaken we do have a letter the actual letter that she wrote to the orlando sentinel and um telling them that they, all that was lies that they put in, in this paper. And she kind of went on and tried to correct them with what should have been said and shouldn't have been said, you know. But they was, you know, a lot of that stuff, she went totally against it. Yeah. And all of the stuff that we're talking about is uh, is public record. I mean, people can uh, can go and check out what you're saying. And, in fact, I think that letter, we have a copy of that letter on justicenews.net slash uh, justice for yes, sir. Bruce Smith. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. On justicenews.net slash justice for Bruce Smith is where we have a copy of that letter where we'll be putting up a lot of the stuff uh, about your case. So let me just rewind a little bit of what we talked about. Mm-hmm. You never entered the room where the boy was asleep. No, sir. You never touched the boy. No, sir. You never even looked at him asleep in that room. No, sir. Only time I looked at him when she told me, asked me what was that on his face, and he was in her in her arms at that time. And we have a witness for that, who is uh, your boy, who was seven at that time. Yes, sir. And did they put him on a stand to ask him that? Hey, did you see your dad? touch him, beat him, beat Cameron or hit Cameron? No, he never took the stand, but he did do a deposition and he told her that, um, that I, from my understanding, that he did see Teresa whoop the kids. And that's how I knew about it because he told me that she, she whooped him um, while he was sitting there in the house. Uh, uh, she heard him whooping him and heard her telling the kids to shut up. And so, you know, she could, he could, he said he could hear the kids screaming and crying and stuff. So was that after she came back or before he left for the laundromat? That was, that was before she left. Okay, so this goes back to my point, what I was trying to make earlier, that this could have happened before she took off for the laundromat. Yes, sir. Exactly. Yes, sir. According to your son's statement, before she left, he heard her beat Cameron. Yes, sir. Yeah, and then he, 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 go ahead. No, I was just saying he, he from his from what he told me, they all got a got a beating. They all got a beating. Yeah, and and then she came out and she asked you to look over the kids while she goes to the laundromat. Yes, sir. Yeah, something is weird here. You know, it's like covering my traps. You know, if I would, if I were, if I had harmed someone. And if I would want to put this uh, on someone else, this is probably what I would do if I have a satanic mind and try to hurt someone. Uh, probably this is what I would do, you know, because obviously when this occurred, she, when whenever wh- whatever happened between her and the kids when she heard that boy, she knew something was not right. Right. And that's when she came to you and asked you to look over while she's gone, so probably to screw you over. Yes, sir. That's, I mean, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, but, and, and um, I'm, I, I'm not even an attorney and I'm making all these assumptions, but I would like to clarify to the listener that I'm making these assumptions based on the evidence, the facts, the facts that are in front of us. Right. This is not like some imaginary tale that I'm making up. These are all extrapolations that are coming out from looking at the evidence. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, cons- and you know, I mean, if anyone wants to push push me back, they should first answer me that a woman who was on suicide watch and you call it the Baker since yeah, what she do you call was it? Baker acted. Baker acted. Baker active? Yes, well Baker Act. It's a it's a Baker Act. It's a it's a what happened when when someone is incompetent or they need um medical attention or you just can't function on your own. Or, or you know, you need some sort of assistance. They Baker Act you so that you would be held. You know, I, and most I, my thing was if you're Baker Acted, 
And she's saying, they saying that she is incompetent. Well, how did she take the stand? Because you can't have someone incompetent. But she, at the time she took the stand, she was on five different types of medication, which she admitted on the stand that she was on. Unbelievable. This is like a bad movie that I'm watching. <laughs> yes, sir. This is like a, it's a terrible movie because, this, I mean, how can they put somebody on stand who's Baker active? Yes, sir. They can. And I mean, I asked them, you know, uh, can she take the stand? I asked my lawyer several times, and she said, well, Bruce, I didn't check into that. You know, I say, well, wow, I said, there's a lot of things you didn't check into, mm-hmm. you know. And then that she that, that she was Baker acting and on suicide watch, you know, I thought, and then not only that, but she was up under five different psychic drugs at the time. She was on the stand kind of raised a, a flag with me because I was like, well, how can she take the stand? How do y'all, how can you believe something she's saying if she's under the influence, you know? Hmm. So you're talking about your defense lawyer, Trish Cashman. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So if if I would just put all of this aside and ask you something, Bruce, did you kill Cameron? No, sir, I didn't. I would never touch him. He was, he was actually a very good kid. I have told her that several times but she always said he always getting hurt he always hurting himself he do this and do that they her all her kids was good kids it's just that they didn't have a man a father figure there in the house so she i don't know if she just took it out because they wasn't there or she was mad at their dads i don't know what it was but she um used to just discipline them so much i didn't even know she had kids about the first week i was there because she kept them in a room and they was quiet <laughs> Yeah, and when there was a father figure, he ended up in prison, like yourself. Exactly, yes, sir. Yeah. So, you know, something is terribly wrong, and uh, there are a lot of holes in this case. And so what, What's been going on the past 20 years, Bruce? Well, I can tell you I've been trusting in God for one. Uh, and praying a lot that you know she would come forth and um, and at least admit to what she had done or she should have done. You know, um, back in 2010, I got a letter from her. Uh, the letter came from Las Vegas, somewhere where she was. She's living, I'm assuming, right now. And the letter said that she was sorry for what she had done. She and she will hope that I forgive her and. Uh, she forgive me for any pain and, and you know but she didn't have a return address on it but she did sign the bottom of the letter mm-hmm. that, do you think that's admission of guilt yes sir I do I tried to present it to a lawyer and ask a, a, a couple of attorneys about it but they was the, the thing they told me was Bruce she's not admitting to the crime well I mean in so many words to me she is because if she's saying those words that means she did something she wasn't supposed to do you know yeah and even if she's not admitting it at least it opens up a case to question her subpoena her yes sir it does reopen the case because uh, you know a wrong man is sitting in prison for over two decades now yes sir so, uh, what about, did you try to get attorneys and uh, reopen your case or appeal? Yes, sir, I did. I did. Uh, my mom uh, had, and dad had hired an attorney. Um, he did get my case where they got some stuff back in court because he admitted to where Teresa admitted on the stand about her discipline. The kids couldn't identify me in court. Um, he was saying that the judgment of acquittal should have been granted because there was no evidence proven that I did anything. And then he went back on what the doctor said, you know, from what the boys said. Y'all saying that the aggravated child abuse, but the boys saying that from what they saying happened, the doctor said it didn't happen. So how can you prove the aggravated part if they saying one thing and the experts saying another one, you know? And then they have to, you know, most of the time we based our decisions on experts' opinions. And so how can you go against uh, a little boy and then it was the state theory to say that it was between six and eight but the experts say it couldn't have happened between six and eight because he'd have been dead at the time of admission so I mean you know it's just so much that where the, the conviction shouldn't have been should have been upheld so then what happened 
Well, what they did, they ended up um, going to the jury. The jury did deliberate. But my thing was, you know, when it when it comes to uh, all of the experts' opinion in my decision, that it should have they should have based their decision on what the experts said because they are more qualified and know more about what and they examine this child. Mm. And, and even based on that, the medical examiner took the and and he said during my trial that he had a skull fracture. Well, when I got his autopsy records, in his records say there was no skull fracture. But he took the stand and said it on the stand. But in his writing, they said none. So, you know, it, it just, he lied on the stand. So he lied? And, you know, and I got all this in record. Yeah. You know, so, you know, if anything that I have said, I mean, you can go to the records and read it for yourself because it's there. <laughs> yeah. So, in these 20 years, there was never an, uh, an appeal or a follow-up. You never went back to court to fight this. You just accepted? No, sir. I have been, I think I have put in at least 25 to 30 different types of motions mm -hmm. during this time that I have been in. And I know I haven't been back to court, but at one, on one occasion, um, the court did, on several occasions, to be honest with you, they ordered a show cause order uh, based on my motion. And the state, uh, their answer was to, uh, that inmates think that they are lawyers and they shouldn't, you know, the, the books and stuff that they have is outdated. So we shouldn't listen to these case laws and all this stuff that he has in his motion. Well, based on that, the judge denied my motion based on that and didn't even hear the merits of the case. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was wrong because when you order show cause, it's based on merit mm -hmm. to what you know you have raised and they got to answer why he shouldn't be granted relief and i wasn't i was denied due process even for that you know yeah and it's a lot yeah but probably because the prosecutors were afraid that if the pandora's box open up opens up and all the evidence comes out there's going to be multiple lines of lawsuits coming up right it will yes sir it will and you have to be mindful too you know uh during these extensive appeals that i put in most of the appeals went back to the same judge and the same prosecutor. So they're not going to admit they're wrong. You know, they're going to try to get avoided any kind of way they can. So, you know, if I'd have had a different judge or maybe someone else to hear it, it may have, you know, may have turned out a little different. But if I have to, they have to keep going back to every motion I was filing was going back to the same judge and the same prosecutor. And they all they had to do was say the same thing. And the judge was, you know, what no matter what she said, he granted it. Yeah, I mean that is weird because you can't go back to the same people who wrongfully convicted you. Right. Yeah, and for the prosecutors to say that the people who are incarcerated think that they're attorneys, well, we have many cases, factual, clear cases where incarcerated people have got them overturned, indicated themselves. That's right. Yeah, they got got it overturned. I mean, a lot of them even know more than the prosecutors and the judges and the attorneys themselves. That's right. That's right. So that was that was wrong. We ha I mean, we have Supreme Court cases overturned because uh, people from inside the prison fought. That's right. That's right. For justice. That's right. And I have learned a lot about that myself because I have been studying law and, you know, I have been sitting here the whole time. I have went and um, got different different degrees uh, in brick mason, electrical, plumbing, you know, and I also been doing a lot of legal work, uh, law law studying, studying the law, and that's how come I can I can look at it now at a different angle because I can see where they violated a lot of the laws and where they broke the law with charging me and trying to find me guilty for a crime that I did not commit. And and going back on what you said, I don't know what they was hiding. Maybe it was. And, you know, when you got a hospital, the first hospital that we took him to had um, sustained him, uh, uh, gave him a, 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 a shot of barbiturates, and even after he went to this first hospital and they said it was transferred into another one. Well, the doctors took the stand and say when he arrived at the second hospital, they didn't have nothing to go on. So they did this process all over again, which gave him another dose 
a barbiturate. Man. And in the autopsy report, it showed that his blood work went to a Waffle Research Laboratory where they tested it and it came by positive and high for barbiturates. And they say in the barbiturates was 0. 0.200 milligrams, which is a overdose. Um, and in lethal injection uh, on death row, they give you 0. 0.5, 0. 0.150. And then he had zero point two hundred in him, and that, and then it go by your weight, Man. your you know your um your age and your condition. And they saying it was an overdose for someone on asthma. They say because if you got a health condition, it's extremely dangerous. And he had asthma. So now we just opened up another Pandora's box, which was my eventual questions, but you brought it to light. Now we have another scenario where the you guys take take the kid to the hospital. He's alive. Yes, he was breathing. And at the first hospital, they gave him barbiturates. Yes, sir. That, and barbiturates are a drug that take over your nervous system. Yeah, and they gave him, at that time, a lethal dose. At the first hospital, it wasn't lethal. It was the right amount at the first hospital. When he went to the mm. second hospital, they inserted the lethal dose because they did the process all over again, and that's where the lethal dose come in. All right, so there's a huge probability that the, the hospital ended up killing the boy. Yes, sir, and that's what I, I mean. It took me a while to just research it and do a lot of um, medical research uh, concerning, you know, researching the barbiturates and seeing what it consists of and what it does to the human body. And um, being that I went through all that, I found out that, for one, and go by his age and you know he was a four year old weighing 40 pounds or 45 pounds or something like that and they said even mm -hmm. what they administrated from the beginning was a little high but it could have he could have bared it but then when you put a whole nother dose of that same amount in him he said that would he say that could kill anybody not just a little boy but it could kill a grown man so so uh, did, was this point brought to, uh, to the trial no, sir, it wasn't. I didn't. I didn't even know anything about it till I had been in prison two years, and I asked. Um, I had to get an attorney to get the um, records and send them to me. I had to pay him to look to get the records for me and send them to me, not knowing what I would find. But um, when I did get them, that was there. So what you're saying is that they overdosed the boy with a lethal injection. I mean, you're saying that they used that in death row. Yes, sir. They use they use the cocktail on death row. It's, they give you three cocktails on death row, and that is one of them. What that cocktail does, it go into your bloodstream and take over your nervous system. So when the nash, when the when the um the other cocktail go in you that stops your heart, usually it give you a burning, and, and you can feel the reaction where some of the guys would be jumping and moving because they can feel the pain. Mm. But this barbiturates yeah. take over your nervous system so you can't jump. You can't do it. And that's what it does. Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable stuff. So, I mean, we need to find what happened with you in this case, but we also need to find what happened to that little boy. Yes, sir, we do. And I'll be more than glad. I, I want to find out because the ones that are in charge of his death should be punished. They should be charged. Yeah, I don't even know what to ask anymore. Because your last line just said it all, man. Yes, sir. And I mean, it's just, it, it, it hurts because I have been here, you know, and like I say, by the grace of God, he has helped me and showed me different avenues, showed me different things. And, you know, and I'm going to continue to pray for him. I'm going to continue to pray for the family uh, and hope that, and, and praying that, she would one day just come out or whoever and just acknowledge what they had done to him and at least take some sort of responsibility for it. You know, I have done time for, for something that I had never done. And, and I mean, it's hurt. It hurt. Yes, I have cried many, many, many nights. But I just thank God that this is finally coming to a head where somebody can hear it and maybe somebody can help do something about it. Well, we will with the help of God. This is Fair Play, Fair Play. on JusticeNews.net. Oh,
You're listening to Fair Play on JusticeNews.net. I can get a damn sandwich ignited by a red jury. 